You may be seated. It's a joy this morning to welcome Joel James to this pulpit. He's familiar to Grace Bible Church, a three decades long friendship with Scott Maxwell. Many of you have been helped and or haunted by his grammar exercises in the hermeneutics textbook of his that we use. He's been faithfully shepherding Grace Fellowship Church in Pretoria, South Africa for 24 years. That is the church that sent us Ryan and Elna Mitchell. And so he partners with us in the work in Papua New Guinea. And he's been in the pulpit before. Joel, please come share the word with us. Well, it's great. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. And I do bring greetings from Ryan and Elna Mitchell and Sebastian and Callista. And, and uh, Ryan started as my secretary and went to seminary and ended up being my associate pastor. So we are sending you our best guy. I mean, there's no question about that. And it is such a privilege and joy for our church to, to partner with a church like your church, even though we're on other sides of the world, to send someone to another side of the world um, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so... I bring greetings from them, of course, from Amelia. She goes to a sister church of ours. We thought you didn't have enough sunshine here in Phoenix, so we thought we'd send Amelia, who is indeed a package of sunshine, if you know her, um, and uh, we'll be praying with you as, uh, as they head uh, on their way um, to Papua New Guinea and serve with your dear friends who are already there. Um, it's been a great joy to me to be with my best friend Scott and Kim, his wife, and to Smedley again to, to, to just renew those friendships. What a joy it is to be in a church on another side of the world where, where the gospel of Jesus Christ is loved, where Christ is held high, and the word of God is taught clearly. And there is nothing that could be more joyful to my heart than to open a, the word of God to a congregation like yours, where I know that is done every week at a very high level in a very powerful way. And so if you would take your Bibles with with me this morning and turn to Exodus. I have the privilege of teaching Old Testament su- survey in a seminary that some friends and I have had the honor of starting down in South Africa, and so, so I wanted to share some of the fruit of that study with you this morning. I've shared it with my church and uh, with Jerry Rags Church in Florida. Uh, turn to Exodus, and you can turn to Exodus chapter 2. That's where we'll begin. We're going to survey, actually, the first 18 chapters of Exodus this morning. It will take us 18 hours to do that, so I hope you brought some, some lunch and some snacks to make it through. That, that is a joke. Thank you for laughing. Let's begin this way. More than 50 years ago, A.W. Tozier wrote a sentence. It was a sentence of monumental significance and insight, a a sentence that is unforgettable in both its simplicity and in its truth. It's the first sentence of his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, and you're probably familiar with it. Tozier wrote this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That is one of the best and most important sentences in all of Christian literature. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Now, I think there are many ways that you could defend that statement regarding the importance of knowing God, the way you could defend that from the Scripture. For example, you could start in John 17, verse 3, where Jesus said in praying to his Father, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. In the same way, in Galatians 4, the Apostle Paul describes salvation as coming to know God, or rather, he says, to be known by God. Likewise, Paul condemned the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34, saying to them with startling apostolic directness, some have no knowledge of God. And he added, I say this to your shame. Now, I know that's not the case in this church because you are a well-taught church. But I think we understand the need for the knowledge of God, to know not merely about God, but to know God. There is, in fact, I would argue, nothing more shameful and nothing more disabling to a believer in Jesus Christ than to be deficient, to to be a, a court low, as it were, in his or her knowledge of God. That's when any, when any believer who, who I'm discipling or shepherding has an urge to, to really start growing in Christ, I immediately recommend them to read J.I. Packer's book, Knowing God. Uh, it's the reason the first major book that I wrote was on the attributes of God as well. 
I am just absolutely convinced that, that the most important thing about us is what permeates our mind when we think about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, another way we could defend that statement is we could think about the Pentateuch. We could think about the fact that knowing God is, in fact, the theme of the first five books of the Bible. The Torah, the the instruction, was inspired by God to help Israel, and indeed us, to know God. The Pentateuch is nothing more and nothing less. It might be more than that, but it's certainly not less than a book of instruction about God. How does Genesis begin? Well, the, the, the opening words of the opening sentence of, of Genesis, the Pentateuch indeed of the Bible, is what? In the beginning, God. Uh, that is where we start. That is the beginning point of everything. Moses' purpose for his book, the Pentateuch, leaps out at you from, from the opening words of the opening sentence. Derek Kidner says, The passage, talking about Genesis 1, the passage, indeed the book, is about him first of all. To read it with any other primary interest is to misread it. But you know, it's not just the book of Genesis that's about knowing God. Uh, I would argue that the book of Exodus is about knowing God as well. In fact, I'm going to hope to prove to you this morning that the word to know dominates the first half of the book of Exodus, those first 18 chapters that lead you up to Sinai and the events that happened there at Mount Sinai. And as you might expect, when the word to know is used in the- theologically significant, theologically charged settings, well, you would expect that God is indeed most often the knowledge that is to be known. He is the one to be known. He is the object of the knowing. Now, interestingly, uh, turn to the end of Exodus chapter 2. Interestingly, the, the first use of this word to know, which I think I'll be able to prove to you dominates these chapters, the first use of the word to know in Exodus is about God knowing us, or the nation of Israel in this case, the family of Jacob. Pick up at the end of Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. It says, now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning. And God remembered, not that he'd ever forgot, he remembers now to act about it. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Abrahamic covenant of Genesis 12. God saw the sons of Israel, and the New American Standard reads, God took notice, and they add an object of them, right? Here's what the Hebrew says, God saw the sons of Israel and God knew. God knew. God knew his promises and God knew them. And that comes together to equal God acting. Literally, it says there, God saw the sons of Israel and God knew. And I would argue that in order of precedence, it is always most important that God knows us before we know him. But the truth is, once he knows us, then we have the privilege and the joy and the the, the duty to know him. We love because he first loved us, right? And so as we survey these opening chapters of the book of Exodus this morning, I want you to be thinking about God, and I want you to be thinking about knowing God. And as I think you'll see, nothing could be more important, and no lack of something could be more dangerous. Now, as we begin, let me remind you of the historical setting. Always important, so turn back to Genesis, and I'd like to start in verse 1 of Genesis 1, but we won't do that. Turn back to the very last verse of Genesis. You know the story up to this point. God has called Abraham, Abrahamic covenant. You work through Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's family is saved from starvation by Joseph in an unexpected way being sent ahead of them, and the family is rescued in God's providential care. And the last verse of Genesis ends this way. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. And verse 1 of Exodus 1 starts with the word and in Hebrew. It's all one book. And these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. They came each one with his household, and the names, of course, are listed. Verse 6, Joseph died, and all of his brothers and all of that generation... 
But the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly, very much Abrahamic covenant terminology, and they multiplied and they became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. Now, that's easy to read, but what you might not realize as we've read just those few verses is that hundreds of years are encapsulated in those verses. Jacob's family immigrated to Egypt about 1875 B.C., so about 1,800 years before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. The exodus took place in 1447-1446 B.C., and all of that was a fulfillment of God's prophecy given to Abraham in Genesis 15, verse 13, that his descendants would be strangers in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved there and oppressed for about 400 years. Now, of course, after hundreds of years in Egypt, when you read biblical narrative, you always need to take yourself back and put yourself in the story as if you were there, because it's just way too easy for us to, we're we're familiar with the stories. So take yourself back and, and count off every one of those 400 years one at a time, and now you're starting to feel what you need to feel. And so you start to step back into that and you realize that after hundreds of years in Egypt, Jacob's family, Jacob's descendants, probably starting to doubt, probably starting to doubt Yahweh's promises to look after them. In spite of the numerical blessings that are talked about here in chapter 1, in spite of all the blessings they've experienced there in Egypt, as the book of Exodus opens, just as you find in the life of Abraham personally, you find also in the life of the the nation or the growing family now, you find threats. You find threats in the life of Abraham. You find threats now in the life of the nation. And the threats are to God's promises, to God's land, seed, and blessing promises. Now, you think about it. If Abraham was tested by God in regard to time in the book of Genesis, and I would consider waiting 25 years for the child of promise to be a test of time, right? If Abraham was tested personally, well, in this case, the nation is now being tested by this interminable season in her history, 400 years of waiting. And for us today, that's the equivalent of waiting for a promise made in 1600. I mean, that's about the time that the Spanish Armada sailed against England and Elizabeth I was queen. You you knew that, right? That is a thread of time. And so the people who are living this out here in the white pages of your spaces of your Bible, they're feeling every minute of that time. They're feeling every year of that time. And that's the thread of time. Now, you add to that here in Exodus chapter 1 the thread of slavery, the thread of oppression, and the threat of genocide. Slavery is not blessing. Genocide is not seed. And with no male babies, the family of Abraham via Isaac and Jacob would soon cease to exist. The, the family of promise will soon cease to exist. And so as you enter into Exodus chapter 1, the, the lingering question, the, the haunting question, in fact, the, the burning question is, Would God's land, seed, and blessing promises given in Genesis 12 and repeated throughout their history, would those promises hold true after 400 years? Can God be trusted is the simple question. Can God be trusted to keep his promises? And indeed he can. As he often does with us today, God placed his people in a precarious situation, completely beyond their ability to extricate themselves from, and then and only then, then and only then did he bear his powerful divine arm and fulfill his promises. You know what that's like, don't you? These people will experience as well. For them, it will be an unforgettable lesson about God. Now, as I said earlier, though, the knowing of God from our side always starts with Him knowing us, His gracious, loving sovereignty. And in Israel's case, God's knowing, electing, choosing, covenant love had, of course not, it had not dried up or evaporated in a mere 400 years. Of course not. God is eternal. That is an eye blink for Him. In fact, that covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12 and reiterated in other places, that becomes the driving force. It becomes the operative energy, the power behind all of God's actions in the book of Exodus. And you saw that in the verses we just read in chapter 2. 
So God heard their groaning and God remembered. He had never forgotten it. Now he is remembering in the sense he will act on it. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God saw the sons of Israel and God knew. God knew his promises and God knew them. And that is going to intersect in a tremendous redeeming act of God. The covenant with Abraham is not dead. What appeared to them to be dormant, now God is ready to spring into action to fulfill. Once again, that Abrahamic covenant becomes the the obvious, undeniable force shaping the history of Jacob's family. Now, to see this, jump over to chapter 4, Exodus chapter 4. Exodus 4, verse 22 Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says Yahweh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Uh, In Africa, I don't need to explain the significance of that, but you're not in Africa. And so uh, America doesn't do much on the order of childbirth and so on. But but in these cultures, that was essential to be the firstborn child was to to be the firstborn son was to be the son of blessing, the son who inherited, the the, the son who had the most authority. It, It was the position of preeminence. Israel, among all the nations of the earth, is the preeminent one. They are my firstborn son. If I could put my seminary professor hat on for a moment, let me teach you something about how you read the Old Testament, Old Testament narrative. One of the ways to determine the, the, the theological point of the story, because the, the stories are true, but they're not just about the story. They're, there's a theological point being made by the true history. And one of the ways to determine that is to look for significant speeches by significant characters. When significant characters make a significant speech and it has theological implications, you're probably being directed to the main point of the story. Well, if you want a significant speech by a significant character, that's it. (laughs) That's as significant as it gets. When God says, Israel is my firstborn, my preeminent one, my blessed one, my beloved one, that's as significant a character as you're ever going to find, saying as significant a thing as you're ever going to find. Jump over to chapter 6 of Exodus, and you'll again see God's unfailing commitment to his covenant with Abraham coming right up to the front, front and center once again. Chapter 6, beginning in verse 2. God spoke further to Moses, and he said to him, I am Yahweh, I am the Lord. And I appeared to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Now, they did know that name, but they do not know the implications and the full covenant implications of that name. In verse 3, he says, I appeared to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as God Almighty, But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourn. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because of the Egyptians who are holding them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Say, therefore, to the sons of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm, with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Again, that's a significant speech by the most significant character in the Bible, God, Father, Son, and Spirit, speaking, saying, I will keep my words. You can trust me. So God knows his people, God knows his promises, and they're going to intersect in redemption in a moment. Here's the question, though. Do God's people know him? And the answer is, after 400 years in Egypt, they don't. They don't. They have assimilated the pagan culture around him. They know very little of God, it appears, as you read the book of Exodus. Moreover, the question is not merely does does Israel know God, but you see, in the Abrahamic covenant, uh, Israel was to be a cup, and God was going to fill his cup up with his love and kindness and blessings, but but the cup was over always intended to overflow into the nations, right? I will bless you, says God, and you will become a blessing to the nations. And so the cup of Israel was to always overflow into the nation, so it is never enough to ask, does Israel know God? We must also ask, do the nations know God? Because indeed, he deserves to be known by all of us, doesn't he? 
And so the rest of Genesis, sorry, Genesis, Exodus 1 through 18, the rest of Exodus 1 through 18 is about God acting. It's about God acting so that five groups of people will come to know him better. It's God acting so that Moses, an individual, that Moses and then Israel as a nation, and then Pharaoh and Egypt, and then indeed the nations as well. So then Moses, Israel, Pharaoh, Egypt, and the nations will come to know God. The universe, my friends, is a stage. The universe is a stage, and human history is a grand demonstration of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, of God and his character, of God and his exalted purposes. And in the book of Exodus, the demonstration of God takes center stage in a dramatic and profound fashion. Now, let's start with Moses. Let's start with Moses. Let's start with Moses coming to know God. If God's people are to know him, then it's vital that God's leaders know him. Does that make sense? I think we would agree with that. If God's people are to know him, God's leaders must know him. And that's where Exodus starts with Moses, God's leader. Now, in the book of Exodus, in chapter 2, there are two events by which Moses comes to know God, chapters 2 through 4. The first event is in chapter 2. The first event where Moses comes to know God is Moses' failure to deliver Israel in his own time and his own way by his own efforts in the middle and end of chapter 2. So turn back there, chapter 2, verse 11. Now it came about in those days, 2.11, it came about in those days when Moses had grown up and he went out to his brethren and he looked on their hard labors and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren, And so he looked this way and that, and when he saw that there was no one around, Moses struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Moses is going to deliver his people from their slavery and oppression. How did it go? Not very well, did it? Not very well. As you recall, Moses had to flee for his life, and he spent 40 years in exile in the land of Midian, the Arabian Peninsula on the far side of the Red Sea. I point that out for you because it's actually a consistent theme in the Pentateuch. When people try to manufacture a fulfillment of God's promises by their own efforts, it never works. And you can think of some examples immediately. The Hagar experiment in Genesis 16. I mean, it worked. They got a baby, but did it work? No, it brought chaos and pandemonium, didn't it? Or how about the fiasco when, when Jacob and his mother, Rebecca, in Genesis 27 tried, tried to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise that the, the, the blessing would go to Jacob and not to Esau? How did that work? Multiple generations of exile there as well. Multiple decades, sorry. In this case, Moses' intervention and efforts to rescue God's people, no more successful than those other attempts to bring about the fulfillment of God's promises. It was a lesson that would lie dormant for 40 years until God's plan succeeded spectacularly, miraculously succeeded. But it would become an unforgettable lesson for Moses about God and his working. And I'll point it out to you in chapter 14 when we get there. Now, the second event in which Moses came to know God was his calling at the burning bush. In chapters 3 and 4, Moses comes to know God in a very profound and personal way here. Pick it up in verse 1 of Exodus 3. Now, Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb in the mountain of God. That's another name for Mount Sinai, Horeb. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. And so Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. 
And he also said to him, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the covenant with Abraham is either more or less visible throughout the Old Testament, controlling everything. Here, in the opening chapters of Exodus, it's very visible. Now, the question is, besides God's covenant-keeping faithfulness, what else did Moses come to know about God at his calling in chapters 3 and 4? Well, as you remember these chapters, you remember that Moses subtly and then overtly at the end resisted God's call five times in this section. And each time that Moses did so, God revealed something new about himself to Moses. Let me walk you through it. First, Moses resisted God's call to be God's leader because of his his puniness, his insignificance. I relate to that. Exodus 3, verse 11. Moses said to God, who am I? Good question. Who am I? Answer, nobody. Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses, you have your eyes as usual, as we always all do, don't we? On the wrong person, God said, certainly I will be with you. Certainly I will be with you. God responded to Moses' concern about his, Moses' insignificance and puniness. God said, let me tell you about my enabling presence. And that's something that every leader of God's people needs to understand. God's enabling presence makes our insignificance inconsequential. Moses' second resistance in this chapter is his ignorance, something that God quickly moved to correct by teaching Moses his name, his his covenant name, the name that, that is a summation of God's eternal divine being, verse 13 and 14. Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Egypt, and I'll say to them, the the, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now, they might say to me, what is his name? What should I say to them? Sounds like a legitimate question to me. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God's name is I am, or I exist. That's all you need to know about him in a sense, that a being that great, that profound, that significant exists, that's that's all you need to know. All your responses should flow out of that. And the truth is that no one can lead God's people without knowing the awesome, worshipful implications of that name, Yahweh, or I am. Now, Moses' third resistance to being sent by God here is his lack of credibility. Again, this one seems reasonable to me. Chapter 4, verse 1. Moses said, what if they will not believe me or not listen to what I say? For they may say, the Lord, Yahweh, has not appeared to you. I mean, that's, that's, that's legit. And this guy's been out in the desert somewhere for 40 years. I mean, if I showed up off a plane from Africa and walked into this church and said, you know, I have a message from Yahweh for you. You know, here it is. I am sent by the God of your fathers. And, you know, here's the message. You give me one of those, you know, cool little white jackets where the, you know, arms fold around in the back and buckle, you know. I mean, why should they listen to this guy? God's response, he teaches Moses about his power. Verse 2, and the Lord said, what's that in your hand? Moses said, well, a staff. He said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground. It became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. God says, you're going to be sent as my messenger, and to back you up, to give you credibility, I will show my miraculous power. And when you add the ten plagues to that package, I think it's time to listen to this guy. You know, I think it's time to listen. Don't worry about the credibility side, says God. I'll take care of that. Now, Moses' fourth excuse was his personal inability or disability. His heavy tongue, as the Hebrew would call it, presumably a speaking impediment of some kind. And to alleviate that fear, God taught Moses about his personal assistance. Verse 10 of chapter 4. Moses said to the Lord, please, Lord, I, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, not in the five minutes since you've been talking to me. Right? I'm slow of speech. I'm heavy of tongue. 
And the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go. And I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. Personal assistance. Now, while the first four hurdles that Moses set up might all have been genuine, there I think is some legitimacy to them. His fifth effort to resist God's calling clearly is not. It's just a flat-out refusal. It's worded very politely, but it is nothing less than a refusal. It's a refusal to take up the mission. Here, too, Moses learns something about God. Verse 13 of chapter 4. Moses says to God, Please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. Translated, that means, I'm not available. Send someone else. God's response, verse 14. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. What did Moses learn there? He learned God has limits. There are limits to God's patience. God is very patient in chapter 3 in the first part of chapter 4, and I think legitimately so. Here his patience runs out. There are limits to God's patience, and that's what Moses learns about God in verse 13. God indeed is patient and slow to anger, gloriously so, but there is a clear limit to his patience, and those who flagrantly test that patience will soon enough find that out. Moses learned here what Israel would learn at the waters of Meribah, what Israel would learn in the quail incident, what Israel would learn in the fiery serpent incident. In fact, Moses learned here what Israel never seemed to learn. There are limits to God's patience. God's patience can be stretched, and it can be stretched to the breaking point. And there might be some of you here this morning who are living in some kind of either overt or secret sin, and you are stretching the patience of God. Can I call you to repent and stop? Can I call you to stop that and come back to the safety of the God who is gracious and forgiving? Stop testing the patience of God. So as the leader of God's people, Moses first needs to know God himself. And that's a great reminder to all pastors and elders and church leaders, to lead well, we must know God. We must know God not as, not as an abstract theological statement or, or paragraph in our doctrinal statement. We must know God personally. We must know God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We must know God through his beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And by the indwelling power of the Spirit, we must know God. Because if we don't know God, our people never will. And that's what Moses came to know in Chapters 3 and 4. He came to know God's enabling presence. He came to know God's infinite name and all of its worshipful implications. He came to know God's matchless power, God's personal assistance, and God's clear limits. All those things would be vital for Moses, for his personal stability and for his leadership courage in the years ahead. Those are lessons Moses needed to know about God. But what Moses learns about God in chapters 3 and 4 is frankly just preparatory. It's just warm up for the main event. In fact, God, as he dismantles Egypt in doing that, God's dismantling of Egypt and Israel's exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea, all of those things were frankly just living lectures. They are sermons. They are living sermons on theology proper. They are living. We're in it right now, acting it out. We are participating in a sermon about God. And the target of those lectures was fourfold. Having dealt with Moses, the target of those lectures is Israel, Pharaoh, the nation of Egypt, and then indeed the nations. And here in chapters 5 through 14, that, that word to know that I mentioned to you starts to dominate this great book. Let me show you. As we move to chapter 5, turn to the opening verses of chapter 5. As we move to chapter 5 and follow, we meet, of course, the 10 plagues. You all know this from Sunday school. We meet here the 10 plagues. Now, the 10 plagues and the exodus that follows the departure from Egypt, they are very familiar to us. In fact, we are far more familiar with the stories than we are with the theology that the stories are intended to communicate. 
When I say stories, you understand it's history. It's the, the story of God. It is true story. These events happened. Right? But the, the history, the story is being told not merely to give us some facts about the destruction of Egypt. It is there to communicate theological truth to us. God's dismantling of Egypt and all that is a part of that, this is lectures about God. Not audio necessarily, but visual lectures. We're familiar with the story, but we maybe don't know the theology. You know the story, right? Water to blood, frogs, bats, flies, death of livestock, boils, sounds like Africa to me, hail, locusts, darkness, death of firstborn sons. You know the storyline perfectly. There is nothing that I could come and do this morning that would teach you anything about the storyline. But what you might have missed all these years is the theology. And that theology is wrapped up in one word, to know. And see it, let's start here in chapter 5, verse 1. And again, let me put my seminary professor hat on for a second and say this. Another favorite technique, besides that significant speeches by significant characters, another favorite technique of biblical authors to teach you what is the theological point that the true facts of this story are communicating to you. Another thing that they often do is they use rhetorical questions. Rhetorical questions. Now, a rhetorical question is a question that the, the answer is so obvious that the answer doesn't need to be given. It's an answer that is never actually, a question that is never actually answered in the text. It's a question whose answer is so obvious that no answer is given. And the rhetorical question that, that Pharaoh throws in the teeth of Moses here in the opening verses of chapter 5 isn't just noteworthy, it literally defines the next 10 or 11 chapters. Chapter 5, verse 1. And afterward, Moses and Aaron came and he said to Pharaoh, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is Yahweh? Well, is that the $10 billion question? Right? I mean, that, that's a really good question, isn't it? Who is Yahweh? And then he makes it better. Who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice? I mean, that's the best question in the history of questions. Who is Yahweh, and why should I obey him? Who is the Lord? Who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh. I do not know Yahweh, and besides, I will not let Israel go. God will spend the next 10 chapters of the book of Exodus, answering that question, who is Yahweh and why should I obey him? Explaining to Pharaoh and everyone else just who he, Yahweh, is. And by the time Pharaoh's nation looks like a Nerf football that your dog got a hold of, by the time Pharaoh's nation is in ruins and the bodies of his elite chariot force are drifting up onto the beach of the Red Sea, Pharaoh will have a much better grasp of who Yahweh is and why he should be obeyed. Pharaoh said, who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice? He is going to begin to know right now. Now, unfortunately, not only was Pharaoh ignorant of Yahweh, but the truth is the nation of Israel was ignorant as well. God's own nation was nearly as ignorant of Yahweh as Pharaoh was. Therefore, the events of the ten plagues are just as much theological instruction for Israel as they were for Pharaoh. You see that in chapter 6. The verses we already read, notice again verses 6 and 7 though. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord's. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. To know God, you need to know that he is a redeeming, rescuing God. God be praised for it, right? He says, I will also redeem you from the outstretched arm, with, or with an outstretched arm, and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. What a great statement. And I will be your God, and you shall know 
You shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. God says, here's why I'm doing this. You, the nation of Israel, do not know me well enough. You do not know me in my power and my glory. You do not know me in my redeeming grace and love. And I'm going to show you who I am. Furthermore, God knew that if he simply eased Israel out of Egypt in some kind of low-key, secretive way, just kind of put all the Egyptians to sleep one night, and you know, they woke up in the morning, and phew, the Israelites are gone. If God did that, the lessons about God's character would not be memorable enough. They, they would not be striking enough. Chapter 7, verse 3. God says, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart. You say, how could any king be stupid enough to ruin his country like this? Well, his heart was already hard, but God's hardening it as well. I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh does not listen to you, Moses, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my host, my my people, the sons of Israel, that beloved firstborn. I will bring them out from the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh. A secretive rescue will not do the job. Then, when I rescue in this way, the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh. When I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. The combination of Pharaoh's hard heart and God's sovereign hardening of that heart will lead to a spectacular and unforgettable lesson about God. Now, let's move to the plagues. When you think about the 10 plagues, you need to not focus on the plagues themselves. They, quite frankly, could have been just about anything. But what you do need to focus on is what points you to the theology of those plagues. And I'm going to give you three characteristics. Write these down. Three characteristics of the plagues. Their severity, their timing, and their selectivity. Their severity, their timing, and their selectivity are pointed out throughout these chapters as the thing that communicate the theology of the ten plagues. First of all, you ask, why the crushing severity of these plagues on Egypt? Well, chapter 7 just told us that. Verse 3, I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Verse 5, when I do that, the Egyptians shall know that I am I am, that I am Yahweh. Their severity has a very clear, distinct theological purpose. But when you study the plagues, you also find that the timing of their onset on one hand and then of their removal on the other, that's also very important to the theology of this passage. For example, look at the removal of the plague of the frogs in chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 8. Exodus 8, verse 8, then Pharaoh called to Moses and Aaron, and he said, entreat the Lord that he remove the frogs from me and from my people, and and I will let the people go, liar, that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, the honor is yours. I guess it's good to butter up the king a little bit. He says, the honor is yours to tell me. You tell me when. When shall I entreat to you? For you and your servants and your people, that the frogs may be destroyed from you. So they know this is not some some magical thing or some coincidence. You name the time, Pharaoh. You name the time. Verse 10, Pharaoh said, tomorrow. And so Moses said, may it be according to your word, that you may know, that you may know there is no one like Yahweh, our God. The timing of the removal of the plague of frogs was to communicate significant theology to Pharaoh. Now, a third critical feature of the plagues was their selectivity. And you remember this one. You see the selectivity first in the fourth plague with the plague of the flies or the insects. Chapter 8, verse 21. Chapter 8, verse 21, for if you do not let my people go, says Moses, behold, I will send swarms of insects on you, God speaking for, through Moses, and on your servants and on your people and into your houses, and, and the houses of the Egyptians will be full of swarms of insects and also the ground on which they dwell. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people, that first Lord, that beloved son, where, where they live. 
so that no swarms of insects will be there in order that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. And I'll put a division between my people and your people, and then timing, tomorrow this sign will occur. Both selectivity and timing are important there, aren't they? And they're to teach theological lessons about God. Now you find the same thing in chapter 9, verse 3. Behold, the hand of the Lord will come with a very severe pestilence on your livestock, which are in the field, on the horses and the donkeys, the camels and the herds and on the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction. Selectivity. The Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt so that nothing will die of all that belongs to the sons of Israel. And the Lord set a definite time, saying, tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. Selectivity, timing, absolutely critical. The plague of the hail also involves those components. Chapter 9, verse 26. Chapter 9, verse 26, Moses says, Only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, there was no hail. Selectivity. Timing is important too. Verse 29, Moses said to Pharaoh, As soon as I go out of the city, I'm going to leave your throne room, I'm going to walk to the city gates, and as soon as I get there, right, as soon as I go out of the city, I will spread out my hands to Yahweh, and the thunder will cease, and there will be hail no longer, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. This is not coincidence. This is not some kind of magic. This is the creator God intervening so that you know the earth is the Lord's. And of course, who could ever forget God's assurance of selectivity in the 10th plague, the, the death of the firstborn sons? Flip over a page, chapter 11, verse 7. Chapter 11, verse 7, unforgettable wording, but against the sons of Israel, a dog will not even bark. <laughs> not even a dog's going to bark, whether against man or beast, that you may, and I have no idea why the New American Standard translated it, understand, because it's that same Hebrew word, yada, to know, so that you may know how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and his beloved firstborn Israel. You see, my friends, the ten plagues are, are, are not Sunday school stories designed to keep the little boys interested with some catastrophic violence. They were and they are powerful theological lessons about God. Do not spurn God's commands. Don't mess with God's firstborn, his chosen nation, Israel. Obey, love, and serve God. So Pharaoh mocks back in chapter 5, who's Yahweh? I don't know him. I don't know this God. You shall know us better hereafter. God took up the challenge of correcting Pharaoh's ignorance. So up to this point in the book of Exodus, uh, Moses in the early chapters, uh, uh, Israel has learned about God, Pharaoh has learned about God, but you know, so we need to add to that Egypt and the nations. It's got to spill out of the cup of Israel into the saucer of the nations. Now, to see the broader populace of Egypt learning about God, turn back to chapter 10 for a moment. Chapter 10, and notice another key rhetorical question. This one comes from the mouths of Pharaoh's courtiers during the plague of the locusts. They're talking to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's servants said to Pharaoh, how long will this man Moses be a snare to us? Let the men, the men of Israel, go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize, it's the word no, do you not know that Egypt is destroyed? Don't you get it yet, Pharaoh? You can't fight this God. And some of you came to Christ for that very reason, didn't you? You found out that through some incident in your life or series of incidents that you said, God, it's time for me to give because if you're going to fight like that, then I want to be on your side um, because you can't fight God. Right? And the, the courtiers are saying to Pharaoh, hey, can't you understand? There, there's no fighting this God. 
would you just, would you just stop and relent from your sin? You can't fight God. You might also remember the the defeated, crushed, and overwhelmed admission of Pharaoh's magicians in chapter 8 after the plague of the gnats. They say, this is the finger of God. You know, we know some things about super, or about the timing of nature and stuff, but but this is beyond that. Uh, uh, We can't use magic to produce this. This is something else altogether. This is the hand of God. In the same way, jump ahead to chapter 14 for a moment. In the same way, the drowning of Pharaoh's chariot force at the Red Sea was also a devastating sermon about the the danger of resisting Yahweh. Chapter 14, verse 4, God says, Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them. I will be honored through Pharaoh and through all his army, and the Egyptians, the nation of Egypt, will know that I am Yahweh. And that's the point. That's why all this is happening. Verse 17, as for me, behold, I I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go in, that's into the Red Sea, after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord's when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. But you know what? Beyond beyond Pharaoh and the Egyptians, even the other nations of the ancient Near East needed to know who Yahweh was. It is not enough for Israel to know Yahweh. It is not enough for Egypt to know Yahweh. He is so glorious and he is so great that the, the knowledge of him must go to the ends of the earth. Everyone must know this God, the great and glorious creator God. They must And so turn back to chapter 9, and you see that God emphasizes that. Some of you are panicking. We're going backwards now. You're like, is he going to get to chapter 18? We'll get there. Exodus 9, verse 14. God says, for this time I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people so that you, Pharaoh, and your nation, so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. But it can't stop at the borders of Egypt. Verse 15, for if if by now I had put forth my hand and struck you, God says, if I was really trying, you'd all be dead, right? Uh, I haven't even broken a sweat yet. If I had put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would then have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this reason, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name, not to Israel, not to Egypt, but through all the earth. So that you might know, indeed all the earth might know who I am. Did it work? Did it work? Well, yeah, it worked. Do you remember the words of Rahab to the spies in Joshua 2? Let me read them to you. I know. It's not an accident. She says, I know. I know that Yahweh has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all of the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard, we heard the sermon and we know, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and how Yahweh your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. That sounds like Old Testament conversion to me. She said, we have, I, Rahab, I've come to know God. I know him, I know his promises, and and I'm ready to follow that God. It worked. The sermon evangelized a woman with three names. Rahab, the harlot. She came to know God. Forty years later, the nations of Canaan had not forgotten what Yahweh did to the nation of Egypt, and they were terrified by it. She's terrified to the point of saving grace, isn't she? God be praised. In fact, the knowledge of God taught by his acts in the Exodus were intended to extend by God far further than 40 years. Turn to Exodus chapter 10, verse 1. Exodus 10, 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh. For I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants that I may perform these signs of mine among them. And that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson. Parents, grandparents, listen up. This is for you. 
so that you may tell in the hearing of your son and in the hearing of your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them that you may know that I am I am, that I am Yahweh. You didn't believe me when I told you to know is the key word of the opening chapters of Exodus. I think hopefully now you're convinced that you may know I am the Lord. The knowledge of God derived from the Exodus event, God preaching visually in those incidents, in those events, that knowledge was to be taught by God's people generationally. Forget 40 years. It was to be taught generation after generation after generation because there is nothing more important than the knowledge of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, it would be fair at this point to ask, just what did Israel, Pharaoh, Egypt, and the nations learn about Yahweh from the Exodus? And I've been telling you all along, but let me just package it up in a list now quickly. Let me give you a rapid-fire list. First, they learned about Yahweh's passionate love for his firstborn, for Israel. It is self-destructive, even suicidal, to harm his beloved nation. Exodus 4.22, this is Israel, my son, my firstborn. Second, they learned that God is absolutely faithful to his covenant promises. 400 years, ha, it means nothing. It is an eye blink to God. Exodus 6, I established my covenant with them. I will bring you out. I will deliver you. Third, they learned about the absolute uniqueness of Yahweh. Exodus 8.10, tomorrow the frogs will die that you may know there is no one like the Lord in all the earth. Fourth, they learned about the power of Yahweh. Exodus 9.16, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power. Fifth, they learned about the lordship of Yahweh over all of creation. Exodus 9, 29, there will be hail no longer that you may know that the earth is Yahweh's. Sixth, they learned about the sovereignty of Yahweh as he hardened and rehardened Pharaoh's already stubborn heart. Seventh, they, they learned through the Passover lamb of Exodus 12. We haven't even had time to develop that. The Passover lamb, they learned their need for a substitute. An unforgettable lesson that was to thrust them ahead in their thinking, to look ahead to Christ, the Lamb of God, who would be the ultimate, the one true efficacious substitute. And eighth, they, they learned what Abraham and Sarah and Jacob and his mom and even Moses learned, God does not need help to fulfill his promises. Let's go back to that point we made in chapter 2, turn to chapter 14 to see its fulfillment 40 years later. Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Here's where that, it didn't work. Moses killed the, the slave driver. Here's where Moses learns the lesson and applies it. Exodus 14, verse 13. Moses said to the people, right? Remember the situation? Their back is to the Red Sea. Their face is to a chariot force they cannot defeat. And Moses says the stupidest thing in the world. Do not fear. Oh, that's clever. Do not fear. And then you realize it actually does make sense. Stand by and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord Yahweh will fight for you while you keep silent. Moses has learned the lesson. God does not need our help to fulfill his promises. The lesson of chapter 2 came, full, came home to Moses in full force here. Jump to the end of chapter 14, verse 30 and 31. Moses sums up as the biblical historian. He, he draws together the point. Thus, verse 30, the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. They feared Yahweh and they believed in Yahweh and in his servant Moses. That's an editorial comment by Moses saying, by the way, if you didn't get the point, here it is. Right? Here it is. When you come to know Yahweh, and unfortunately we know with this people it was superficial, wasn't it? It didn't go even skin deep with this group. 
But when you truly come to know Yahweh in a true and saving faith in God, in our case, this side of the cross, in his beloved son, Jesus Christ, when you come to know Yahweh, what you do is you fear odd worship, and what you do is you believe humble faith. And so, turn now to chapter 18. We've got one other thing to do. God's matchless character and his redeeming, delivering, saving acts dominate the first half of the book of Exodus. It is a book written so that we might know God. And to finalize that, we need to jump ahead to chapter 18. The the intervening chapters 16, 17, they're important. What God is doing in those chapters, he's proving to Israel that he is the divine personification of good government. He is good government. He gives them food when they're starving. He gives them water when they're dying of thirst. And he gives them an an efficient, just, legal and governmental civil civil justice system. I mean, what more do you want from government? He protects them from their enemies as well in chapter 17. There's not a lot, lot left for good government to do, right? God is the embodiment of good government. That becomes important at Sinai. But I want to draw your attention to where Moses sums up the opening 18 chapters. He does that here in the middle of chapter 18. Like all other Old Testament narrative authors, Moses often summarized, sorry, seminary hat again, right? Moses often summarized the key theological point of his narrative by means of a significant speech. In this case, it will be a significant speech by an insignificant character. Moses is going to reach into the historical account and say, someone who was actually there said something so important that just, that just wrapped it all up so well that I'm going to grab that and I'm going to draw it into the scripture and put it there forever. Now, I would recommend to you guys that you never call your father-in-law an insignificant character. It's not going to go well, right? But what Jethro says here in chapter 18 is a guy who, frankly, is an insignificant character. Jethro could disappear from Exodus, and you, you wouldn't miss much, right? But what he says here sums up the whole point. It is a significant speech by an insignificant character. Moses reaches into the count, grabs those words, and says, that's the point. Chapter 18, verse 8. Moses told his father-in-law all that Yahweh had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians, all that he had done for Israel's sake, the beloved firstborn son. All the hardship that had befallen them on the journey and how Yahweh, the personification of good government, how he had delivered them. Jethro here, standing for the nations, Jethro rejoiced over all the goodness which Yahweh had done to Israel in delivering them from the hand of Egypt. So so Jethro said, blessed be the Lord. I mean, this is Abrahamic covenant. The, the, The blessing is spilling out of the cup and into the saucer, and the saucer's name here is Jethro. Jethro said, blessed be the Lord who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh and who delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that Yahweh is greater than all the gods. Sounds like Old Testament conversion to me. I now understand. I now realize that your God is the God of gods, that all other gods do not matter. Please spell it with a small g, but Yahweh is capital G. He is the one and only God. Now I know. Now I know. He heard the sermon. That's the point of the book of Exodus, at least the opening 18 chapters. For Israel's sake, because of his loyal covenant love for Abraham's seed, Yahweh justly afflicted their genocidal enemies and in his goodness redeemed and delivered his people. Now I know. Now I know that Yahweh is greater than all the gods. Now here's the point. If God inspired five books of the Bible, the first five books of the Bible, to communicate that message so that you and I, so Israel and now today, you and I would know God. If he inspired those first five books of the Bible to communicate that message, don't you think you should set your heart? Don't you think I should set my heart to, through his beloved son, know this God? To know and love our creator. God is not a paragraph in your doctrinal statements. 
He is a living, infinite, divine being who has loved you in his son and whom we have the privilege of loving back. Don't you think that if you're a shepherd in this congregation that you should set your heart and your study and your preaching and what you do so that you will know God, so that your people will know God? Of course you do that. Paul said, some of you have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. I know that's not true in this church because I know your shepherds and I know what they teach you. Right? But we can know God better. We can know God better and more. And here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you an assignment. I often do this. I'm going to give you an assignment. I want you to go back and I want you to read the first 18 chapters of Exodus. You cannot do it on an iPad or a cell phone. It's not quite the Koran, but it's close. So, all right, I want you to do it on paper. You need to do it in a paper Bible, a real Bible, an inspired Bible, right? You need to go back and you need to read this in your Bible and you need to do it with a pencil in your hand and you need to underline every use of the word to know or its equivalent. I pointed some of them out to you. Every use of those so that for the rest of your life, when your Bible falls open to those chapters of Exodus, you know what it's about. And you are reminded irreversibly of the glory of God. And you are reminded to worship and to love and to know your God through his beloved son, Jesus Christ. We need to know God. And that's what the Pentateuch is about. And so set your heart Set your mind, set your schedule, set your time, set your affection, set your love to know your God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, it is just a joy to preach about you, to exalt you, to glorify you, to lift you up. You are the object not only of our intellectual knowing, but of our love and affection, and that is especially through your Son, your glorious Son. And Lord, we, we long to know you. We long to, to love you more. And I pray for this dear, beloved congregation who is so well taught and so well shepherded that this would stir up again the fires of their heart to know and love their great God. And Lord, I pray for those who, who need to know God better, who are testing his patience right now. 